right, so you'll sometimes hear the P format referred to as P slash COF. Uh, COF is common in object file format, Unix file format, um, portable executable derived from that basically. <coughs> And so you'll kind of see that the first couple of headers of the P format are more like cough headers, and then everything beyond that where all the real details are, those are the stuff that Windows added on to do what they needed to do. All right, and so then on uh, Unix systems, so whereas P is used primarily by Windows, the interesting side note is you've maybe heard increasingly about um, UEFI, Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, the sort of, it's not a BIOS replacement so much as it is a way to provide new capabilities to BIOSes going forward. You know, you've probably heard of Windows 8 Secure Boot, that requires UEFI. Um, UEFI is really just a way to make it so that there's these services which are running after BIOS. So BIOS usually would start up and then it would be done, it initialize the operating system and then it let go of the system. UEFI, there's these services which you can call to that run, uh, <clears throat> run post boot. Anyways, uh, UEFI extensions are actually using the P format. So basically, you compile. The point was to, you know, it's unified extensible firmware interface. Extensibility here meant that no longer people had to write their BIOS uh, extensions using, you know, hand coded assembly things like that. You're basically going to be able to take normal compiled C code, it compiles it to a P file. And then it's going to be using that down as a, you know, kind of think of it like plug-in driver down at the BIOS level, something that runs after the fact. So anyways, previously I would have said P used primarily by Windows. Now it's actually part of the uh, specification for UEFI. So P for Windows and UEFI, ELF for Unix systems, Linux systems, and Mach O or Macho for Mac OS X. And I have a you know, clip of Macho Man and I would sing and I would dance, but <laughs> it doesn't actually work on, uh, doesn't actually work on this. Sorry. <laughs> All right. In terms of the, the, the um, you know, different types of files which are going to use these uh, binary formats, You've got your basic executable, that's a standalone thing that you run this program from command line or double click it on a GUI interface. And that's going to be something which will execute and run either continuously or it'll run and terminate, whatever. So that's, you know, a .exe on Windows or most typically it has no suffix on Linux. Then you have a dynamic link library or shared object. So all this is is basically a library which is going to contain some code which will be used by other programs at runtime. So before I showed you the loader, imports a bunch of libraries and then it lets the program run. So on Windows, that's a DLL, and on Linux, that's a .so file. And all it is basically is some set of code where it's going to be loaded up by the OS loader and uh, it will support other programs. Now that said, you will actually see that and this matters more for the DLL injection and the equivalent sort of LD preload attacks on Linux. Um, libraries will still typically have sort of a main function, a function which will be invoked when they're loaded up. So on uh, DLLs, it'll typically be called DLL main. And so when the OS loader loads up the DLL, it does have an entry point where it says, okay, I'm going to call this function in you and you're going to run some initialization code. You can get all of your you know, global variables set up or whatever. And then, you know, I'm going to run your initialization code, and then I'll proceed to the next DLL. So this is something that, this, this capability is something that attackers take advantage of when they're doing things like DLL injection. They, you know, just by virtue of this DLL being loaded by some other program, they don't have to actually export functions like a real DLL. A real DLL, the point is for it to export functions. And for the, uh, with DLL injection, basically, you just don't export functions, you load yourself up and you run all your code in the main, basically. So on Windows, that's typically DLL main and that's init on Linux, on shared object files. All right. Um, and so static libraries then are things where you basically, that live on Windows. Now, these are sort of interesting because oftentimes these don't actually use the binary format. They're usually more like Think of them like just a big array of object files, and they'll maybe have a little header information that says, uh, 
you know, object file A, a is here, B is there, C is there. So uh, static libraries are basically used where you want to compile all of the information down to one file which can be linked again, linked against for static linking. So at compile time, you're basically saying don't use the, you know, don't, dear linker, don't set printf to use this DLL that's going to load up, you know, the, uh, the runtime C library. So don't use the printf from the DLL that's going to run at load time. Use the printf from my particular implementation. You know, that can be a simpler implementation, a more complex one. But the static library is basically something where you're linking against uh, that at link time and you're providing all of the code and you're saying, like, just incorporate this code into the main binary so that uh, it basically uh, doesn't call up to some external library at runtime. And this is typically, you'd use it for making your code stand alone better, basically. Okay, so again, I want to add this again. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I think, you know, this kind of just illustrates the uh, two of the two of the three different things. Remember, we have a pointer stick in here. Love the pointer stick. Hey, Bill, we have a pointer stick in here. Uh, is it on the, um, the next to the whiteboard in the rail? There we go. All right. Can we get the screen over here on video? All right. So, as I said, you know, we've got multiple different things using the binary format. We've got an EXE which stands alone, but it only stands alone to some degree. You know, oftentimes it's going to uh, import other libraries, and so the OS loader has to go out and find those libraries and move them in. And so when this gets loaded in, the uh, loader then has to say, like, what does it depend on? It has to go find those and get those loaded in as well. Beyond that, each of these, as I just said, has, you know, a DLL main so that when this gets loaded in, the loader will call that main function. And so it'll start this thing's code. It'll start that thing's code. So they're all initialized. And then when everybody else is initialized, it'll go back and it'll start the wicked screen app that you see. So that's why an attacker who's, you know, in some way, you know, whether he's Trojan to file on disk, whether he's set some registry entry to add an extra DLL, um, he can actually get his code running before the main code, and then he can, you know, scribble all over this wicked suite app.exe and uh, manipulate it before it actually starts running. All right, so these are just common things. This is, I put this on here just kind of to give you a heads up because some of these you might not uh, realize you're dealing with EXEs or dealing with P files. Um, so you're familiar with EXEs, DLLs, and maybe .sys files. .sys is a typical kernel driver. OCX, then that's an ActiveX control. Really, that's just a DLL, basically. It's a DLL that Internet Explorer loads up and has a bunch of native code. And that's why it was uh, such a source of uh, vulnerabilities for a long time, because they weren't jailing these uh, ActiveX controls in any way. And you're basically just loading a DLL. The attacker could force it to be loaded and then could call some vulnerable function and uh, do a buffer overflow in the ActiveX control. Control panels as well are actually uh, EX are actually P form uh, files. If you monitor processes when something's running, you'll actually sometimes see that they'll have exported functions out of these control panels, like I think Power Manager is one of them, where you'll see it run using the executable run dll32.exe, and the only point of the executable run dll32.exe is to call specific exported functions in DLLs and things like that, and you'll actually see it calling functions on control panels in order to like set some parameters, you know, set the uh, resolution or something like that. I can't remember an example specifically right now, but I just know that I've seen uh, seen Run DLL calling uh, exported things from control panels. And then screen savers as well are executable. So that's a common thing for social engineering and stuff like that. You say, hey, download this cool screen saver, and people don't realize they're downloading and executing you know, full real code. Right? And as I already mentioned, lib files and you know, .a files are typically not actually uh, well formed. Well, they have their own format, but it's not just a straight up uh, P or L file. <coughs> so, you know, if we're, we're not going to use uh, Visual, Stu uh, Visual Studio too much in this class this time around, but uh, this is just to show that notionally when you're compiling uh, in Visual Studio, there's just sort of a drop down box where you say, I want to compile an EXE or a DLL. And GCC on Linux should just be, you know, giving different options. 
Thanks, Matt.